All right, so welcome back. This is going to be screencast number two for chapter 24, and we are going to continue our discussion of fish. And if you recall from our first screencast, we had looked at the group of fish known as the jawless fishes, and that included the hagfish and the lampreys. And so what we're going to do next is we're going to transition into the fish that actually have jaws. And the first class we are going to look at is the class chondrichthys. And the class chondrichthys is going to identify the cartilaginous fishes. And so we have fish in this particular group that do not have bone for a skeleton. In fact, it's completely absent, as you see down here in the third bullet. Um, they have a skeletal structure that's actually primarily composed of cartilage. Now, there's about 970 living species um, that belong to this particular class. They definitely have a very well-developed um, set of sense organs, and for most of the members of this group, they have very powerful jaws. Now, as we had said, true bone is almost completely absent throughout the entire class. Most of these animals are going to be marine in nature, but there are approximately 28 species that do live primarily in fresh water. And we also have a few species that sort of migrate between marine and fresh. In other words, they can sort of inhabit what we consider a brackish type of environment. Now, after whales, sharks are considered the largest living vertebrate, which are those animals that have backbones, um, that you would find on this planet. And there are some out there that actually reach approximately 12 meters in length, and that's about 36 feet. Now, we're talking about the class chondrichthys, but we're going to look at a specific subclass called elasmobranchi, and these include the sharks, the skates, and the rays. And there's about 13 living orders of elasmobranchs, with about 937 total species that have been described up to this point. Now, the first order that would fall underneath this subclass is the Carcahiniformes, and these contain the coastal tiger shark, the bull sharks, and what's more commonly known as the hammerhead. Now, the order Lamniformes is going to contain large, what we consider pelagic sharks, and this would include the white shark and the mako shark. Now, when we use the word pelagic, we're talking about those sharks that are going to inhabit a, an open ocean type of environment. Now, the third order that you see here is the order Squaliformes, and this is going to contain the dogfish sharks, and this is actually going to be the um, order that we're going to look at in lab. You guys will dissect a dogfish shark in, in class. The order Rajaformes is going to contain the skates, and the order Myliobataformes is going to contain the group that is identified as containing the rays, and they're very similar to um, the skates that you see in this order right up here. But this would include the stingrays and the manta rays. Now, for most of the members of this particular class, the body is going to be fusiform in shape. Now, what we mean by fusiform is simply a body shape that looks somewhat like a torpedo. Now, this is an adaptive um, type of body shape because it actually makes these animals um, fairly efficient at swimming through the water. Now, thrust and lift is going to be provided by an asymmetrical, what we consider a heterocircle tail. Now, it's heterocircle because um, the prefix hetero actually refers to difference. So what they're comparing here is they're comparing the top part of the tail with the bottom part of the tail. And so if you had a tail that actually had the top part, pretty much the same size as the bottom part, that'd be considered a homocircle tail. But in this case, they're very different, so we consider it heterocircle. Now, the vertebral column of these animals is going to turn upward, and so what they're referring to here is if you look at the vertebrae of these animals, as it runs along the back of the animal, you'll notice it's going to make its way up into the top part of the caudal fin, or the top part of the tail. Now, when you look at the fins of this class, we have a pair of pectoral and pelvic fins. And so the pectoral fins are going to be located right here. So these are the ones that are more um, anterior in the animal. And the pelvic fins are going to be right here. So we have one on each side. So they are considered paired. Now they're going to have one or two median dorsal fins. And so in this case, you see this example. The first dorsal fin is right here. And they have a smaller dorsal fin towards the um, rear of the animal, towards the posterior region. Now they're going to have one median caudal fin. Now the caudal fin is another um, word for the tail fin. Now sometimes they might have a median anal fin as well. Now again, it kind of depends on the type of um, 
uh, cartilaginous fish that you're looking at, but in this case, if you look right here, the anal fin is not present. Now, in males, the medial part of the pelvic fin is going to be modified. Now, it's going to be modified to form a structure called a clasper. And down here towards the bottom, you can see this clasper right here. And this clasper is going to be used when these animals reproduce. So they're going to be used in copulation or mating. Now, they have paired nostrils that are going to be anterior to the mouth. And you can see the nostril in this example right here. And you can actually see it down here as well. So this is going to be in front of the eyes. They have lateral eyes, which means their eyes are going to be found on the side of their head. And they are considered lidless eyes. And so you're not going to really see a shark that has its eyes closed. Now behind each eye is a structure called a spiracle. And the spiracle is located right here. And you'll see these in the dogfish shark that you look at in class. And they're actually a remnant or a throwback to that very first gill slit in these animals. Now they have a very tough and leathery skin that is made up of placoid scales. And I encourage you guys to um, take your hand, um, take the glove off of your hand when you're in lab and run your hand um, up and down the back of your shark. And you'll see what that skin feels like and you'll actually be able to um, um, sense those placoid scales. Now they have scales that are much different from the um, bony fish that we're going to look at um, later on in the chapter. Now these placoid scales are basically there to reduce water turbulence. So again along with that sort of fusiform body shape it allows these animals to get through the water very efficiently. Now they can detect prey at a distance um, by a very large olfactory organ. Now olfactory means they basically have a very good sense of smell. And so they're sensitive to about one part per 10 billion um, particles in the water. So that's what makes these animals extremely efficient at picking up various scents um, from a great distance. Now in some sharks, there's been some adaptations where the nostrils have been pushed to each side of the head. And a good example of this is the hammerhead shark. And the reason why these sharks have their nostrils to each side is that it's going to improve what we consider stereo olfaction. So again, remember, olfaction is simply smell. And if you know what stereo refers to, of course, it means having sound, for example, on all sides of you. Well, in this case, these animals can actually smell in all directions. So they sort of smell in stereo. Now, in addition to using that stereo faction to detect prey, they could also be located oftentimes from very long distances using very low frequency vibrations that are picked up by the lateral line of the shark. And down here towards the bottom, you can see an example of this lateral line. Now at close range, of course, they're going to switch to vision. And most people don't realize, but sharks have really, really good vision and even are able to see their prey in very dimly lit water. Now up close, sharks are also guided by bioelectric fields. And most living organisms have these bioelectric fields that actually surround them. And so these sharks can actually pick up on these. And what they're going to do is they're going to use very special electroreceptors that are located very close to the nostrils of these animals. And in fact, it's kind of scattered towards the very tip of the anterior end and oftentimes ventral to that anterior end as well. And these are called the ampullae of Lorenzini. And you can see these located right here. So all of these little dots that you see located right above the eye, maybe right here at the tip of the, um, the, the nose of the animal, and of course right along here, these are going to be used to pick up on those bioelectric fields um, of those other animals. And of course it's going to help that animal to sense its prey when it comes down to feeding. Now another unique characteristic about the cartilaginous fishes is that they're triangular teeth that in addition to being very sharp are constantly being replaced. A lot of times as these animals feed, um, what they'll do is they'll lose teeth. And so in the back of the um, jaw of the animal is going to be a, usually two, three, maybe four rows of teeth that are going to be lying there in wait. So as the tooth is lost, another one is just going to come up and take its place. Now the mouth is going to open into a very large pharynx and this is going to contain the openings to the gill slits and the spiracle. And so if you look right down here, you're going to notice that we have the gills that are found right through this area of the animal. And so all of this right through here is going to be considered the pharynx region of the shark. Now they have a very short esophagus and that short esophagus is going to run to the stomach. And so down here you can see the stomach being located right here. So this would be the stomach and they're going to have a short esophagus which it looks like in this picture is not identified but this right here would identify the esophagus of the shark. 
and the liver and the pancreas are going to open into short, straight intestines. And so right down here, you can see the intestine being identified, and the liver right through here, and you can see the pancreas right through here. And again, these are a very close proximity to that intestine. Now, they have a structure called a spiral valve that's going to be found in the intestine, and its main function is to slow the passage of food and make sure that plenty of time is given to absorption of the nutrients that are found in that food item. Now, they have a special structure called a rectal gland, and this rectal gland is going to secrete salt, so NaCl is going to represent salt, and assist the kidney in how it functions. Now, the heart chambers are going to provide a very standard circulatory pattern throughout the gills in the body. Now, we'll look at these items in a lot more detail when you get into lab and actually begin the dissection of the shark. Now, reproduction and development in this particular group of fishes is going to vary, but in all cases, you're going to have a situation where the fertilization is going to be internal. Now, remember the males, they have that special modified pelvic fin called a clasper. And that clasper is going to be used to copulate or to mate with that female. Now, maternal support of the embryo is going to vary. They're either going to be oviparous, ovoviviparous, or viviparous. Now, an oviparous situation is where you actually have a shark, a skate, or a ray, in other words, one of these members of this particular group of, of fishes, that will lay eggs. And a mermaid's purse is a really good example of an egg that's laid by an oviparous species. And if you notice right down here, this is going to be an example of that mermaid's purse. It's basically sort of a, a horny capsule that encases the egg that's laid, um, again, as we would said, by some oviparous species. And you can kind of see the um, developing embryo within this egg case. Now, if you have those species that are considered ovoviviparous, ovoviviparous means we have a shark species um, that has retained the eggs within the um, female. Um, dogfish shark, for example, those ones that you will look at in class are actually ovoviviparous. But in regards to comparing this group to this group, ovoviviparous species, they retain the eggs, but the embryos really don't derive any nutrients from the female. All of the nutrients that they need to grow is going to be found in the yolk sac of that um, growing embryo. Now, in regards to how they're born, again, these aren't considered egg layers, so they will actually give birth to live young. Now, that's similar to the viviparous, because these also give birth to live young as well, but there is a definite connection between the growing embryo and the mother. So they're very similar to us. In other words, they'll have a placenta, and that placenta is going to form that connection in regards to getting nutrients to that growing embryo. All right, so that's going to finish up our second screencast for Chapter 24. As always, please make sure that you have completed your screencast study guide before you come to class.